The Purple Sapphire by Edward Heron Allen Writing as Christopher Blair Told to you by Edward E. French On the 24th of June, 1920, a few months after my appointment to the Professorship of Mineralogy in the University of Cosmopoly, I received as a gift to the museum from the surviving executor of the late Sir Andrew Arkwright, under the most dramatic conditions, the Purple Sapphire. The facts attendant upon its arrival were as follows. Sir George Amboyne, the Regius Professor of Medicine, came into my room and deposited upon my table a small package. "'This is for you,' he said, "'a gift to the mineralogical department, "'made under most unfortunate circumstances. "'An elderly man has been run over by a motor-car just outside. "'He was brought in, very badly damaged, "'though not, I hope, fatally. "'As I was in the building, I was sent for, "'and have done what I can pending his removal to hospital. "'When he recovered consciousness, he said with some difficulty, "'The packet! Where is the packet?' The porter, who had carried him in, produced this parcel which the man had been carrying when he was run over. When he saw it, he said, "'For the museum, purple sapphire, give it to them.' Then he lost consciousness again. You see, it is addressed to the mineralogist, University of Cosmopoly. You had better take charge of it. Rather an ill-omened way to receive a presentation, isn't it? I observed. "'Very,' replied the Regius Professor. "'I suppose we'd better open it?' We did so. Beneath the outermost wrapper was an envelope, addressed to my executors. It was unsealed and contained a sheet of notepaper upon which was written, It is my earnest wish that this packet shall not be opened until seventy-five years after my death. When that time has elapsed, it is to be delivered to my eldest male direct heir. It contains the purple sapphire given to me by the younger son of Colonel George Cardew. Whether by that time its power of doing evil to its possessor will have waned or not, I cannot tell, but I earnestly recommend my heir to get rid of it, if he can, at the earliest possible opportunity. Clement Arkwright, Baronet. This is very queer, remarked Sir George. The poor old man downstairs was evidently on his way to deposit it. Whatever it is, here. Let us have a look at it. The removal of the inner wrapper disclosed a sandalwood box. Inside that, closely fitting, was another. Inside that, another. There were seven of them, one inside the other. In the last and smallest, wrapped in a piece of curious fine muslin, was the purple sapphire. It was, without exception, the finest stone I had ever seen, perfectly cut, of the most brilliant, deep amethyst purple, and the size of a flattened bantam's egg. It was set in a sort of cage, Two silver snakes, with their tails in their mouths, ran round it above and below the circumferential edge, and these were connected and held together by twelve small silver plaques inscribed with the twelve signs of the zodiac. On one side were two silver rings, evidently for suspension, and from these hung so as to cover and conceal the stone. On one side a circular plaque, evidently of very ancient make of the kind familiar to students of occultism and of the rites of the so-called Rosicrucians as the seal of the Tau, a Greek T, surrounded by a flat band on which were engraved the familiar mystic letters Abracadabra. This fell over the flat or table side of the stone. Over the other, the faceted side, hung a pair of amethyst scarabs, evidently early Egyptian, threaded upon and held in place by thick silver wire whether it was the circumstances in which it had reached us, or for some other and inexplicable reason, as I held it in my hand, I felt an overwhelming sensation of nausea and faintness. I handed it to the Regius Professor without a word. He turned it over in his hand, raised the towel in the scarabs, and then put it down on my table. What a beastly thing! he observed. We looked at one another for a few moments in silence, but neither of us gave utterance to the thoughts that were in our minds. Probably we could not have done so if we wanted to. I was the first to break the silence, with an effort of which I felt ashamed. I think, said I, we will take it straight up to the museum. Yes, said Sir George. For God's sake, let's get rid of it. He was quite unconsciously reiterating the advice of Sir Clement Arkwright. 
Using one of the lids as a tray, we carried the purple sapphire up to the museum and placed it in the table case by the door, destined to contain recent acquisitions which had not yet been registered and classified. When we came down again, the elderly gentleman had been removed to the nearest hospital, and his relations, as indicated by letters and cards in his pocket, his name was also Arkwright, had been notified by telephone. That afternoon, the mineralogical wing of the University Museum was struck by lightning. The damage done was ghastly. Many priceless exhibits were destroyed, and several weeks elapsed before the room could be opened and used again. The table case of recent acquisitions was untouched. It was perhaps a year after this that a card was brought to me bearing the name Sir Gilbert Arkwright. I had not forgotten the purple sapphire, for the romance of its acquisition stuck to it, and students showed it to visitors as the unlucky stone, and invented all kinds of fantastic stories about it. The assistants, and even the charwomen, hated it. One story went that it glowed at night with an unearthly refulgence. I was foolish enough to go up one winter evening, when the lights were turned off, to see for myself. I saw nothing, but I confessed to having experienced a sensation of... To put it mildly, extreme discomfort. I felt like a child afraid of the dark. Idiotic. One of the charwomen declared that one evening when she was cleaning up a naked heathen, and what's worse, black, had suddenly looked at her over the top of the case she was dusting, and she would sooner lose her place than ever enter the mineralogical room again. Idiotic. Well, the card of Sir Gilbert Arkwright preceded the appearance of a charming young man of the regulation British athlete type. In the thirties, I should say, in answer to my look of enquiry, he said easily, I think you have here a purple sapphire, which my uncle was bringing here the day he was killed in a street accident. I was shocked to hear this, and all the circumstances recurred at once to my mind. I murmured some conventional phrases, and the young man replied, Oh, that's all right. It was a terrible thing, of course, but that was the last of it for us. We were none of us allowed to see it, but it was supposed to have been, and was called, the curse of the Cardews in my father and grandfather's time. I only came to bring you this book which turned up the other day, and going over a lot of my poor old uncle's papers, we thought you might like to have it. He laid on my table a small quarto manuscript notebook of the cheap American cloth-covered type, the first page of which bore, without more, the Nigapur Sapphire, and the date, 1885. I was rather thrilled, and having suitably thanked my visitor, he left me. That night I took the book home with me, and, after dinner, I sat down to read it. There were only a few pages written upon. As is usual with notebooks, the story they contained was so uncomfortably weird that I offer no apology for transcribing them in full. The original manuscript is in the library of the Mineralogical Department, MM3B36. The Manuscript of Sir Clement Arkwright I hope and believe that I have made such arrangements and provisions as shall prevent any of my immediate descendants taking the Nigapur sapphire into their custody, possession, or control. But there exists a widely spread impression in my family that it is a jewel of great value and of exceptional beauty, which is indeed the case. I think that in the future some member of my family may be moved by curiosity or cupidity to claim possession of it. I will, therefore, write in this book my reasons for not wishing this to happen. One of my earliest recollections is that of Colonel George Cardew and his wife. They lived in a poor little cottage, how poor I was then too young to appreciate, on the outskirts of the village nearest to my father's place in Shropshire. The colonel used to give me pennies, and his wife cake, but the latter gifts were discounted by the fact that she was everlastingly advising my mother to give us castor oil, and periodically insisted upon our being taken to see the dentist. We children resented this interference, if interference it really was, in the placid lives of an otherwise very happy family. The colonel was an invalid and very lame, the result of a wound received in the Indian mutiny which continually gave him trouble. His wife was peevish, continually at war with fate which held from her the position of wealth of a great lady. In fact, as the saying goes, they had seen better times, and were ill-adapted to worse. They had two sons, Richard and George, who were the constant playfellows of my elder brothers. I was too young for them. These two boys, after they left Halle Berry School, cut themselves adrift and set out to make their own way in the world by sheer grit and hard work. Richard became a medical student. 
and as he was a sharp contrast to the lazy, rowdy class which constituted the medical students in those days, the early seventies, he passed his examinations with distinction and, having no home prospects or capital, joined the Indian Army Medical Service. He was always known as Dr. Dick. George won a cadetship at Sandhurst, and, knowing that he had no one but himself to rely upon, worked hard, did well, and was in due course gazetted into an Indian regiment where he rose to be a major and was regarded as a very rising man. He was always known as Major George. Their sterling merits carried everything before them. In due course, Dr. Dick left the Army Medical Service and became a successful physician in Simla. Major George, promoted to colonel, became resident to one of the Indian native rajahs, and was regarded as one of the really noble administrators under the Indian government. Their rare visits home were hailed with delight, not only by their old parents, but by all of us, for they brought home wonderful things from India as presents, and would talk how they talked, thrilling accounts of their lives out there, of dangers from rebels, from snakes, from wild beasts, from plagues. We were never tired of listening to them. Then old Colonel Cardew died and within a year his wife followed him to the grave. Though their later years were much ameliorated by handsome remittances from their sons, they were never happy. The colonel was a terrible sufferer, and they were really unlucky in small things as in great. If they saved money and invested it, the investments went wrong. People always said that if they had wanted to cultivate weeds, or to encourage rats in their little place, the weeds would have refused to grow, or the rats to be encouraged. It was a sorry business when Dr. Dick came home to wind up his parents' affairs, and he returned to India a distressful man. He told us he was afraid to go back, for he felt that his luck was gone. This was quite inexplicable to us, but he was a true prophet, unfortunately. An untoward accident or two in his practice, one fatal one in the treatment of a great Maharaja, dragged him down from his professional eminence. A bank in which his savings were invested, an unlimited concern, failed, and carried with it the whole of his savings. And in the end, Dr. Dick, who was fortunately a bachelor, was reduced to living in a suburb of London on an allowance made him by Colonel George. After some ten years of an aimless and unlucky existence, he fell out of a railway train and was killed. There were those who did not hesitate to doubt whether his tragic death was accidental. After his death, fate seemed to turn her malevolent attention to Colonel George. He became unpopular with succeeding viceroys, and lost influence and castle in the service. Finally, not supported as he should have been by his government, he came to loggerheads with his Maharaja. An insurrection in his native state was attributed to his management or mismanagement. He was superseded and sent on a punitive expedition to the borders of Afghanistan. In this affair he failed utterly and unaccountably. The natives, soldiers, and civilians alike seemed to hate him, and of the few faithful six whom he commanded only one returned with him. The rest had been killed. His other troops had practically deserted him. It was amazing, for until the death of Dr. Dick he was almost worshipped by the natives, both civil and military. On his return to Madras, he twice escaped assassination by a miracle, and in the end he was retired and came home to live on an inadequate pension with his wife and two children. The change, I suppose it was, preyed upon his wife, and she went mad. His daughter died, apparently of what was not then recognized as appendicitis, and his son, having gone utterly to the dogs, fortunately emigrated to New Zealand and was never heard of again. It was then that I came into the story. Colonel George was, as I have indicated, some six or eight years my senior, but this did not count so much when I was thirty and living a rather luxurious bachelor life in London. Colonel George often came to my rooms, and we used to talk over old times and on occasions to dissipate mildly together. He was always cheerful and seemed quite resigned to the ill luck that pursued him. He said that it did him good to be with me, for my good luck was proverbial. I had health, wealth enough, and a reliance upon my lucky star that never betrayed me. Let me down is, I believe, the modern expression. <laughs> One day, when I had made a preposterously lucky hit over a horse race, we were celebrating the occasion at dinner at the now extinct St. James restaurant. I said to him, cheerfully, Now, why can't you strike a streak of fool's luck like that? Well, 
Clement, my boy, I have a good mind to tell you. I have often thought of telling it to someone. I rather quailed. Was my ideal Colonel George going to confess some shady episode of the unknown past that was dogging his footsteps, embittering the present, and making the future ominous? However, he changed the conversation, and after dinner he asked me to go back with him to his rooms, up near Regent's Park, a wretched place, instead of coming back to mine, and I did. When our pipes were lit, he sat looking at the empty fireplace for a little while, and then got up and went into his bedroom. When he returned, he had in his hand the Nigapur sapphire, the most splendid stone I had ever seen. I thought it was an amethyst, but he told me no. It was a purple sapphire. Jewelers sometimes call them oriental amethysts. Here in the manuscript follows a long description of the stone and of its setting, practically as the professor of mineralogy has given it above, C.E. I said to him, You don't leave this about, do you, in a place like this? Yes, it always lies about on my dressing table. Aren't you afraid of it being stolen? No. It has been stolen. Three times. How did you get it back? I didn't get it back. I didn't want to. It came back. It always comes back. What do you mean, you didn't want to? I'd give all I possess, it's not much, to get rid of it, instead of which I've given all I possess for keeping it. This is the curse of the Cardus. My dear George, I said, you are raving. No, I am not. You asked me at dinner about my bad luck. Well, you hold it in your hand. That stone has ruined my whole family in turn. I protested, such things only happen in books. Listen to me. You know what a distinguished servant of John Company my old father was. He looted that stone off a statue, an idol, if you like, of Vishnu at Nigapur, a stronghold of the mutiny. The whole shrine was razed to the ground by order, not a trace of it left. Next day he got his wound, one of those mysterious wounds that never heal. His never healed. It tortured him to his dying day. A month later he was on his way home invalided out of the service, they said at home. But do you know what they said at the secretariat in Calcutta? No, what? Cashiered for cowardice in the face of the enemy. It was hushed up, first, I hope, on account of his past services, and then on account of the probable effect upon the loyal native troops. On the way home, his skull was fractured by a falling block. He was trefined and got over it, but his brain was never really clear again. You know how we lived down there in the little old house. Pretty wretched, wasn't it? But what none of you knew was that my mother loathed the sight of my father. They never saw one another excepting in company. He was weak in the brain, as I said. But his nightmares were awful. I didn't know until afterwards that he was haunted by the phantom of a Hindu yoga. As he paused, I put in uneasily. Of course, sick men do invent such things. He didn't invent this one. It was the attendant of the shrine of Nigapur, whom he had cut down himself. And my governor knew that it was after the purple sapphire. Why didn't he get rid of it? George Cardew smiled. You have a short memory, Clement, he said. I told you just now, we can't get rid of it. The governor sent it out by post to a man stationed near Nigapur and told him to restore it to the temple or shrine, and if he couldn't do that, to sell it. It came back with the notification that there was no trace or record of the shrine, and the jewelers and the bazaars refused to buy or even to touch it. My father sent it out again to another man, told him to bury it at Nigapur. Six months later it came back by post. The man had buried it just as he received it with my father's letter. Whoever dug it up got his address from that. Why didn't he send it out without a letter to an imaginary address? He did. It came back through the dead letter office, straight to our village post office, and of course they knew there. I'd have got rid of it somehow. Would you? I'd like to see you try. A brilliant idea occurred to me. Give it to me, I said, and I'll undertake to get rid of it. You wait till you've heard the rest of it. When the old man died, and then my mother, it came to Dick. Well, you know what happened to him. I was at the zenith of my career when Dick died. Good God, Clement, my boy, but I, I was just on the point of stepping up to goodness knows where. And then I had to take over the purple sapphire. 
On hearing of Dick's death, I spent eight pounds on a cablegram telling them to put it away and on no account to send it to me. I was too late. It had started. The day after he died, before he was buried, they sent it off. It arrived with his watch and chain and his shirt studs. The rest of his chattels only just paid for his funeral and a few small bills. Well, you know what happened to me. I had the bright idea to present it to my Maharaja, who had millions worth of gems. He refused it, and he began to mistrust and hate me from that day. I offered it to the government collection, but they looked upon it as a sort of attempted bribe to cover the mess I was making of things. I can't tell you what plans I made to get rid of its scores, but it always came back. And there it is. He paused, and after lighting his pipe again, he smiled and said, Do you still want to have the damned thing? Rather, I said, you know my luck. It's impregnable. Don't say that, for heaven's sake. It's an awful thing to say. But I mean it, I cried. I defy ill luck. And if I can't get the better of a mere stone, nobody ever will, he interrupted quite gravely. We argued the matter for some time, and in the end I persuaded him. I took a cab home in the small hours, delighted with my splendid new toy. Two years passed during which, personally, I was quite unaffected by any malevolent influence attributable to the purple sapphire, but I am bound to confess that there was something about it which passed comprehension and defied investigation. To record an instance or two, I was deeply interested, as a hobby, in the elucidation of a curious text, half Persian and half Urdu, but this has nothing to do with the story, and a young Hindu scholar was sent to me by the professor of Arabic and Persian in the University of Cosmopoly with a view to the discussion of some obscure points and to the augmentation of his income. He was a clerk in the Anglo-Indian house in the city, and he arrived one evening about 8.30. He was called Mr. Something, ghosts, I remember. I had the books out on my study table, and we had been at them about half an hour, during which I thought Mr. Ghost the most incompetent and absent-minded fraud I had ever met. At the end of that time he rose and said, with a little bow, You will excuse. I cannot work. I do not like this house. I go away. I was very much astonished and not a little annoyed, and expressed myself with some succinctness. All he said was, as he made for the door, I'm sorry, very, I, I did not know. You must excuse, I go. And he went. Shortly after this, my friend the professor of Arabic dined with me. Always a delightful occasion for me, for he had been for many years principal of a Mohammedan madrasa in India and was a delightful talker. As we sat before the fire, smoking after dinner, I noticed that he looked all round the room at intervals, uneasily it seemed to me. I said, are you looking for anything? No, he replied. No, I don't think so. Uh, tell me, though, do you collect Indian curiosities? No, I think them as a rule hideous. You haven't got a tear tonker in the house, have you? One of those little squatting alabaster idols one sees in the curiosity shops? No, I've seen hundreds of them, and I hate them. You are not far wrong, replied the professor. They are beastly things. How? Oh, they are uncanny things to have about. And he changed the conversation. Five minutes afterwards, he looked round again, rose suddenly, and looking into the dark end of the room, he exclaimed, I thought so. I felt it. Who are you? What do you want? For heaven's sake, what's up? I said. Haven't you seen that before? A Hindu squatting on his heels, naked excepting for a loincloth, scrabbling at the carpet. There in the corner? My dear fellow, I observed, I know you are not drunk, nor are you mad. What is it? He did not answer me at once, but extending his hand in the direction in which he was looking, he called sharply, Go away! He sat down again with a short laugh, and relit his pipe with a shaky hand. I don't wonder you are surprised, he said. I'm sorry for this exhibition, but I've been so long in India. These things get into one's blood, I think. It's very stupid. You're sure you haven't got any temple loot about the place? There's a lot of it about. I thought at once of the purple sapphire, and, rising, I took it from the drawer of my writing table and put it into his hand. Good heavens, he said, of course this is it. This is what he is after. 
It's the pectoral gem of a Hindu god. Where did you get it? And how long have you had it? I gave him an outline sketch of the history of the purple sapphire, which he had put down on the table by his side. And when I had finished, he said, Of course, that explains it, if anything can be said to explain the inexplicable. My advice to you, my earnest advice, is to get rid of this thing as quickly as you can. Why? Because, for goodness sake, never tell anyone of this incident or of this conversation. It will hurt you, smash you, sooner or later. We spent the rest of the evening in a most gruesome conversation. The professor told me a number of stories in point, and if I had been an imaginative or nervous person, I should have been very much upset. But I am not, and I wasn't. That was the last time the professor dined with me until afterwards. There were other such incidents, greater or lesser in degree, but I never saw any yoga and suffered no ill effects from being the custodian of the purple sapphire, which gradually acquired a romantic and rather fearsome interest among my friends. I pass on to the night when I gave a dinner party, which we shall all of us remember to our dying days. End of part one of The Purple Sapphire by Edward Heron Allen, writing as Christopher Blair. Told to you by Edward E. French. A copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Inquiries should be addressed to Permissions Manager at email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. Good night.